I am Michael Brooks, and joining us now is a Professor Dominique Ariel uh, of the University of Ottawa, where he is the chair of the Ukrainian Studies Program. Professor, how are you? Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to get the, uh, the context here. Uh, obviously, a lot has happened uh, over the past uh, 48 hours. Uh, and I would like you to start um, by maybe uh, uh, situating a couple of parts of the conversation of what's happening uh, in Russia and Ukraine uh, uh, for us that I think are kind of important to sort of uh, set, uh, set the stage for this discussion. And I think the first step is to kind of uh, clearly define, uh, there's, there's a lot of different rumors uh, uh, and frames on who exactly made up uh, the Ukrainian opposition. Everything from uh, this is a progressive and uh, open civil society movement, which I have to tell you that would be certainly what I'm inclined to believe. Uh, and then there's this other notion that it's actually very uh, reactionary, very right-wing, uh, and that Jewish citizens of Ukraine Russian-speaking citizens of Ukraine uh, have uh, a real reason uh, to worry, and obviously that leads to the justification for Russian uh, intervention uh, that they're presenting for for uh, for invading uh, Crimea. So, can you set the stage for us of explaining uh, what this new? I guess it isn't opposition anymore. What this new Ukrainian uh, leadership is, uh, and and perhaps uh, what you think is really motivating uh, the Russian action. Okay. Well, the 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 opposition that is now uh, that is is now the majority in parliament uh, is comprised of three parties: uh, the party of the new prime minister, Mr. Yatsenyuk, who was foreign minister in the years of uh, Yushchenko. I would call that party a center, uh, you know, rather a centrist party, uh, closely associated with. Uh, actually, it is the party of Yulia Tymoshenko, mm -hmm. uh, the, the former prime minister who was in prison for two and a half years, but is currently has been released, is not quite back in, in, in politics yet. Um, you have the party of Mr. Vitali uh, Klitschko, who is a former world uh, champion in, in boxing, and who um, launched his political career about a year and a half ago in parliamentary elections. And he, uh, he campaigned uh, largely on the issue of corruption and accountability, mm -hmm. did extremely well, um, and one was one of the leaders on, on, on Maidan during the, the three-month uh, demonstration. And the third party is... Um, a nationalist right party, some would say far right or populist right. Mm -hmm. Party is called Svoboda, which means freedom in Ukrainian. There is no question that this party, uh, in terms of how uh, it uses symbolisms of World War II, when you had the um, popular insurrection in Western Ukraine against uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and that movement uh, committed, well, targeted, let me put it that way, uh, Jewish and Polish uh, civilians. Mm -hmm. um, there is no question that on the whole issue of World War II, the Jewish question, um, this party is problematic, on the other hand. And to the surprise of most observers, this party during, throughout the, um, uh, the three-month um, demonstrations that turn into a rebellion, the party actually acted as a parliamentary party, mm. and fairly responsible. And uh, for instance, the ill-fated uh, agreement that was signed uh, in extremist uh, uh, a few hours before everything fell apart, that agreement that had been brokered by three uh, representatives of the European Union, and that call, basically, Yanu Mr. Yanukovych conceded uh, just about everything but his position. That, that accord was also signed by uh, the Svoboda Party, but it was then rejected uh, on the square and Maidan. The most troublesome element is actually um, in, in current Ukrainian politics are not the three parties mm -hmm. that have now formed a government in a coalition. Um, but an organization that arose from the demonstration that called itself the, the right sector, Pravi Sector, mm -hmm. so basically um, activist, uh, that formed the backbone, most likely, of the demonstrations, particularly when the demonstrations turned violent. 
Um, this this is a movement that we know little about that um, appears to share uh, far right views. Um, some people have some people have drawn an analogy between what you're the group you're talking about and and Golden Dawn, uh, the overtly neo fascist party in Greece. I mean, is the, do you think that's this a fair? This is profoundly comparison? wrong. This okay. is a profoundly wrong analogy. Yeah, we have to understand the the the, the symbolism. Well, first of all, when the Russian state officially considers that uh, fascists came to power in uh, in in Kiev mm -hmm. and justify its current military intervention because against of the the threat of fascism, we have to understand what fascism means in Russian vocabulary or in you know the connotation it has in Russian political culture for that matter in post Soviet political culture. The fascists are the Nazis that is in in the memorialization of the war. Uh, in the Soviet Union and now in in Russia, we never hear about German invasion of the Soviet Union. Always a fascist invasion of the Soviet Union. So fascism, the fascists are the Nazis. But in terms of the Ukrainian nationalists, it's not that they back then or they now espouse any kind of a Nazi or fascist uh, conception of the world. But they associate in terms of, you know, their symbolism, the, 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 their sense of where they're coming from, with a movement that, for tactical reasons, allied itself with the Germany during World War II, in the context where actually they come from territories that had never been part of the Soviet Union or mm -hmm. Soviet Ukraine. And these territories were annexed by the Soviet Union in uh, violation of international law that, that came about following the, the secret agreements between Hitler and Stalin. Right or known in history books as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement. Right. So even though that movement committed, uh, certainly was involved in massacres of, of Jews and Poles, they fought in terms of their insurgencies against a Soviet occupation. But f the discourse we hear from Russia is that they're basically they're fascists, they're Nazis, and so forth. This is very, very different from Golden Dawn, which actually espouses a fascist uh, mythology. Yeah, it's very overt. I mean, I, symbolism. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I want to actually build off of that because I think this is an important point, uh, and and obviously, again, correct me uh, uh, if this is if this is problematic way of viewing it. But it seems like with Russia uh, and with Yanukovych himself, as a, 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 he's also talked about this protecting Ukraine from fascism. Uh, but it seems an interesting dual track because it seems that Russia is presenting to the world or its global audience to the extent that there is a global audience uh, that, th yes, it, this is about protecting Ukraine from fascists, this is about protecting Ukraine from anti-Semitism. But then on the other hand, within the domestic context of Russia and with uh, Yanukovych as well, uh, the argument seems to be very different. It seems to be uh, protecting Ukraine from European Union. Some of the uh, anti-gay uh, uh, agenda in Russia has gotten mixed up with this. And in fact, uh, also uh, a certain type of uh, uh, anti-Semitism and conspiracy about Jewish power uh, as well. So are those two tracks happening? Uh, is that how you see it? Well, on anti-Semitism and the whole Jewish question, we have to set the record straight. As I said, there is, in terms of what we could call historical memory, it is an important issue about you know whether Ukraine, Ukrainian movements, you know, have to come to terms with what happened in World War II, the same way that um, every country has come to terms with what happened in their own past. But in terms of the current situation, and you could you know you could ask the chief rabbi in Kiev yeah. and many other Jewish sources, there is absolutely there was absolutely no anti-Jewish dimension right. to the Maidan uprising. Actually, the anti-Semitism came from state forces. Right. You had to, simply had to go to the website of Berkut, this infamous uh, special forces that were involved in uh, brutality against civilians. Um, the anti-Semitic anti -Semitic tropes were all, all over. Um, so it is really not an issue now. Well, it is because there are all these accusations. Um, what we've observed in the last seven, ten days in Ukraine, particularly in western Ukraine, to some extent in, 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 in Kiev, there's been a relative breakdown of civil order. That is, at the height of the rebellion in Kiev, basically state authorities 
I wouldn't say collapsed, but were were taken over by um, um, insurgents in Western Ukraine, taking over you know, the the, uh, the regional administration, sometimes even uh, the police and so forth. And they, we have reports of activists basically acting like vigilantes, mm-hmm. and we have reports of you know public humiliation rituals and so forth. What we don't have reports of are civilians being targeted. Mm-hmm. Properties have been targeted. So these are you know concerns, but they are blown out of all proportion by the Russian state to justify right. that suddenly all kind of Russian speakers or so-called compatriots, that's, something, that's a word we should come back to in the conversation, or under physical threat, which is actually in the resolution of the, the Russian uh, Duma of last Saturday, and in particular in Crimea, uh, in Crimea, where there's absolutely no evidence of any of that happening. Right. If it's happening, it's in western Ukraine, far, 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 thousands of miles away from eastern Ukraine and, and Crimea. So... Let, let's take let's go to the Russian uh, action. I mean, and, and I guess the the basic question or a two part question for me is one, what is 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 this is this motive uh, as simple uh, as I as it appears to be, which is just a, a kind of crude exercise of exerting uh, regional power. Uh, that's that's what it seems like to me. Uh, and then the, the second question I have is. And and maybe this is a misperception of Western uh, analysts, uh, but do you? I think there was a there was a perception that Russia would certainly retaliate in terms of uh, economically, in terms of flow of energy uh, and heat, uh, but not necessarily take such an extreme uh, step. So, uh, in those two questions, what sort of really driving this, and is it a was it a misnomer uh, to think to really expect anything other? Uh, than the action they've taken? Well, no one expected it, mm-hmm. really. I mean, mm-hmm. who could expect that Russia would actually effectively declare war on Ukraine? Yeah. I mean, I'm talking to you now, it's midday and on Monday, and Russia issued an ultimatum. If by 5 a.m. local time, the Ukrainian troops in uh, Crimea will not surrender, then the Russian troops will storm their garrisons. I mean, this is an act of war. Absolutely. And um, and the resolution Saturday, I mean, Crimea was bad enough because it's a clear violation of the agreements that were signed in the 1990s to secure the international, you know, the territorial integrity of Ukraine. But the resolution doesn't limit itself to Crimea, to Ukraine. So now we have the very probable or possible um, expansion of this invasion to, to eastern Ukraine. No one could have ever imagined that actually Russia would go to war over Ukraine. I mean, it's one thing to use economic uh, levers or pressure, um, such as shutting down basically the, the custom points that already happened in, in August and then and, and in the run-up to the, the EU summit in Lithuania in November. Um, Russia, you know, have been using, well, let's say, media war in, in as much as uh, Ukrainians, and particularly in eastern Ukraine, watch Russian television, but actually use military means. It is absolutely uh, unprecedented. What, well, unprecedented in, let's say, in the, in the post-Cold War, in the post-war era. We, what really troubles me, I mean, we have here from the New York Times this morning, Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany told Mr. Obama by telephone on Sunday that after speaking with Mr. Putin, she wasn't sure he was in touch with reality. Yeah. People briefed on the call said, in another world, she said, um, a world that doesn't appear to be um, grounded in actual empirical facts. So we had the, the Russian Duma on Saturday in, 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 in this kind of uh, uh, rushed uh, decision to... Uh, and to issue the resolution, I mean, the discussion was basically about the so-called genocide that was happening in Ukraine and the 150,000 refugees coming out of Ukraine, which bear, again, no relationship to reality. Um, yeah, so I think that's a very important point yeah. to underline, Professor. I think it's it's yeah. very key. It's not it, when you talk about numbers like that. It's we're not even talking about an exaggeration or uh, uh, or being loose or something. You're really talking about things that are out of whole cloth. They're just not accurate. 
they're not accurate, and they remind they remind ourselves almost of a different era, which turned out you know catastrophically mm-hmm. when you had basically Mr. Putin as essentially absolute power in Russia, and the media broadcasting that kind of I'll choose my words here that kind of narrative. Let me put it that way. Uh, a kind of a surreal narrative that is now being co-opted and taken by the main political elites, you know, those voting laws in, in parliament, is extremely worrisome. Because, you know, what will be next? The attempt to essentially split Ukraine in two, destroy the Ukrainian state? I mean, are we thinking Czechoslovakia 1938, essentially? Right. Is that what's on the books? Because it is pretty clear that for Mr. Yanukovych thinks that, but he has no power left. He, he's convinced that everything that happened in the last three months is a Western con- conspiracy. That the, the Maidan mobilization was basically an intervention by the West, right. uh, a meddling. Right. And uh, well, that he still thinks that, as we do, as we was revealed in the press conference, is you know interesting enough. Except he's kind of a footnote right now. But Mr. Putin is not a footnote. And he appears to believe the same thing, which, again, I mean, we can discuss what it means, you know, Western intervention, Western political support. But for three months, essentially, the support was verbal. There was no evidence of any other kind of support than just moral support by the EU and the United States or Canada uh, until the very, very end when the the personal sanctions were were taken. But that followed, actually, uh, the decision by the Ukrainian state to use live live ammunition against uh, civilians that they crossed the line. No, I think again, it's it's a very important point when you're discussing uh, this decision-making process. That it's not all uh, when when leaders like this talk about Western uh, conspiracies uh, that may not again have empirical validity. It doesn't mean uh, that they're being cynical. They may, in fact, I mean, they could be being cynical, but they may, in fact, actually uh, really believe this view. Uh, as we move towards winding this conversation up, what are uh, you know, this is a very bleak uh, picture we're outlining here, obviously, first and foremost for Ukraine, but it, se- it definitely has uh, broader implications. What are the uh, pressure points uh, that could actually be uh, applied uh, to Russia uh, realistically that, that may uh, halt uh, this, this catastrophic uh, movement of events? I mean, that, that's, a very, that's a very tough question. We have, you know, we have experts I mean, uh, that are telling us, you know, something we kind of already knew that most of uh, um, Russian export are raw materials and raw materials and energy. So that's uh, energy. I mean, Europe is dependent on gas and, and oil from from Russia. So the, the 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 issue of sanctions, you know, a la Iran, and then with I mean would now not seem to be realistic because that would mean a very, very high cost, um, very high level of pain for European states. Who are already experiencing a lot of pain, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what has been raised is the issue of personal sanctions. Now, will that be enough? Probably not. But the what is interesting and fundamental, actually, because the same dynamics applied in Ukraine, is you have um, a contradiction. Some would call that an hypocrisy. That is, you you hear discourse, you know, from the Ukrainian state up until the collapse of the Yanukovych regime. You hear the same discourse in Russia about a Western conspiracy, so protecting yourself against, you know, Western intervention. But at the same time, in terms of investments, um, in terms of you know, moving away money acquired through all kinds of means in terms of sending your kids to uh, get an education, in terms of acquiring property and vacationing, right. Right. it's all in the West. It's all in the West. Buying soccer I mean, the teams. Same West, yeah. The same West that supposedly uh, calls the shot or seeks to intervene. So at the elite level, um, and we're talking about a very broad stra- stratum of elite here, uh, it's, uh, let's call it, for lack of a better word, a love-hate relationship with the West. Because when everything is said and done, the money is not in Russia. The kids are not in Russia. And the vacations are not in Russia. And the the nice houses, they're in the West. 
And so actually the West, uh, European states and the U.S. and Canada have, have moved on have, um, in terms of the, applying the sanctions. So for the Ukrainian elite, a lot of their assets already have been frozen and, and the list have been released. If something of that sort were to uh, apply to Russia, you would see, uh, of course, a lot of complaint, but a lot of pain. Now, is that sufficient in a, in a system which is essentially an autocracy right now? where you don't have countervailing levers of influence, certainly not the parliament or lower or higher chamber because you don't have competitive elections in, in Russia and all the, these decisions are taken unanimously in the, in the semblance of, of debate. And you don't have a free media except for some courageous outlets on the web and some radio stations. And that, that is also very worrisome because power is uh, extraordinarily concentrated in the hand of... Uh, one man. Absolutely. Well, Professor uh, Dominique Ariel, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, uh, Professor Ariel is the chair of the Ukrainian Studies Department at the University of Ottawa. Thank you so much for joining us today.